My report is about curriculum development. The definition of curriculum varies in terms of scope, structure, and breadth. This is likely caused by the different roles within education, ranging from teaching assistants, principals, or external verifiers. A prescriptive curriculum definition given by Ellis is that curriculum provided us with what ought to happen, and they more, they more often than not take the form of a plan, an intended program, or some kind of expert opinion about what needs to take place in the course of study. Basically, the curriculum can be defined as the plans made for guiding learning in schools, usually represented in retrievable uh, documents of several levels of generality and the actualization of those plans in the classroom, as experienced by the learners and as recorded by the observer. Those experiences take place in a learning environment that also influences what is learned. As a result of this obscurity, many different models have been produced to clarify what the curriculum is and how it affects those that make use of it. The curriculum can be broken down into five areas. The official, actual, formal, informal, and hidden curriculum. The official curriculum is what is published in the prospectus. This will include the individual courses, the content of these courses, including the syllabus, awarding body, number of hours of teaching required, etc. The official curriculum will also include legal requirements such as the requirement, for instance, of formats and for math and English. The actual curriculum is the reality. Ideally, this will be close to the official curriculum as possible, but it's not always possible. Example, if you are teaching business and technology education, the official curriculum includes a wide selection of units from this course. However, the actual curriculum includes units which have the resources, staff, expertise, and time available. Next is the formal curriculum. The formal curriculum includes areas that are outside the scope of the core uh, course uh, core course material, but are still included within the course. For instance, this may include work placements, employability lessons, activities, and math and English uh, classes. This applies to each of the courses. Next is informal curriculum. A step further away from the course is the informal curriculum which includes areas such as the student union, nurse, priest, sports activities, and trips. None of these are managed by the staff of the courses in the school. The last one is the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is an understood to be caught rather than taught. These are the subconscious influences um, the management, staff, and other students have within the teaching organization. An example of the hidden curriculum is the requirements of lanyards and student identification cards. The following are the models of curriculum. The first one is the product model. The product model focuses on the end result than if you can, that if you can produce a product that meets the unique requirements you have learned sufficiently to complete the course. Using the analogy of a journey, it is the arrival at the destination which matters most. Okay, the benefits of the product curriculum, one is the structure and content are clear and concise, while the, markings is, the marking is efficient. The product-based approach can also be very motivational for students due to its behaviorist approach. They know what the goal is and have a clear direction along with what they will receive if they reach the goal. Next is the process model. The process model proposed by Stenhouse in 1975 it states that creating is more important than the result. 
an analogy is that the journey itself is more important than the destination. This model is excellent <clears throat> for engaging creative skills and getting people thinking as the primary goal is to improve. The final product is of little importance. To the point, a final product may not even be required or even if the final product is of poor quality, the student may still be deemed successful due to their process. This contradicts actually with real life, whereby there will always be a pressure to finish work and the final work will be what is assessed and your performance judged based on that product. This cognitive and contract constructivism approach is extremely evaluation-based in which if the student is effective at evaluating, they will perform well no matter the subject, their skill or ability. The next is thematic model. The thematic model focuses on implementing themes within classes. This can be a, a very effective method as learners will enjoy a theme they are interested in while breaking the monotony of classes. It is very common for learners to become engrossed in topics as a result of the theme and will frequently relate the subject and theme to their own interests. There are some negative to the thematic model, such as if learners aren't interested in the theme, they may feel the topic is irrelevant and ignore the material. As the classes will be theme-based, specifically specific skills may not be taught and the focus of the class may become biased due to the theme and the teacher's knowledge of that theme. The next one is a spiral model. In a spiral curriculum, as proposed by Brunner, a topic is revisited on different occasions, each of which builds increment incrementally on the previous learning, taking it to a deeper and more complex level. The spiral method is featured throughout education as a student moves from one primary or from primary school to secondary school and then into further education. The same topics are covered repeatedly. Each time in greater, le greater levels of depth, further challenging students while building upon and re -enjoy, reinforcing their existing knowledge. Let's now move on to the components of a curriculum. Curriculum plays, we know uh, it plays an important role in an educational system. It is somehow a blueprint which leads the teachers and the learner to reach the desired objectives. As a result, authorities have to design it in such a way that it could lead the teacher and the learner meet the desired learning outcomes. The four components of the curriculum are the curriculum aims, goals, and objectives. Second, curriculum content or subject matter. Three, curriculum experience. And the last one is curriculum evaluation. Aims, goals, and objectives can be simplified as what is to be done, the subject matter content, what subject matter is to be included, the learning experience, what instructional strategies, resources, and activities will be employed, and the evaluation approaches while curriculum evaluation is what methods and instruments will be used to assess the results of the curriculum. For the curriculum goals, aims, and objectives, the curriculum aims, goals, and objectives spell out what is to be done. It tries to capture what goals are to be achieved, the vision, the philosophy, the mission statement, and objectives. Further, it clearly defines the purpose and what the curriculum is to be acted upon and try what to drive at. In the same manner, curriculum has a content. So the second one is curriculum content or subject matter. In here, it contains information to be learned in school. It is an element or a medium through which the objectives are accomplished. For the third um, component, the curriculum experience. Instructional strategies and methods are the core of the curriculum. These instructional strategies and methods will put into action the goals and use of the content in order to produce an outcome. This would convert the written curriculum to instruction. Moreover, mastery is the function of the teacher. 
direction and student activity with the teacher supervision. For the fourth curriculum, by the way, is the curriculum evaluation. The curriculum evaluation is an element of an effective curriculum. It identifies the quality, effectiveness of the program, process, and product of the curriculum. Okay, so curriculum can be revised, but what um, could be a possible reason for the revision of the curriculum? So whenever there is a need, a regular revision updating process should take place based on the feedback from all stakeholders. For instance, um, the Department of Education saw the need of the implementation of the K-12 curriculum for the Filipino learners to be globally competitive. Okay, because we lack the, the students, the Filipino learners lack skills and um, principles, academic principles. Um, so K-12 was implemented by the DepEd. With the COVID-19 pandemic, now with the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, the Department of Education implemented adjustments in the basic education curriculum to take into account the current situation brought about by the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. To confront issues arising from the pandemic, the Department of Education actually crafted a learning continuity plan or the LCP for the school year 2020 to 2021. The learning continuity plan is the major response and commitment of the DepEd to ensure the health safety, and well-being of the learners, teachers, and personnel in time of the COVID-19, while finding ways for education to continue amidst the crisis for the upcoming school year, or for this school year. Now let's have the K-12. What are the features of the K-12? Why do we have to, or why, why did we implement this in our education system, or why did we adopt this? The K-12 is an education system under the Department of Education. This curriculum aims to enhance learners' basic skills, produce more competent citizens, and prepare graduates for lifelong learning and employment. The features are, one, the K-12 uh, program offers a decongested 12-year program that gives students sufficient time to master skills and absorb basic competencies. Second, students of the new system will graduate at the age of 18 and will be ready for employment, entrepreneurship, middle-level skills development, and higher education upon graduation. The K-12 program accelerates mutual recognition of Filipino graduates and professionals in other countries. Kindergarten is mandatory. Before, it's not mandatory. It's not required for the student to, to, to go to kindergarten before um. Moving on to elementary. Kindergarten now is mandatory for five-year-old children, a prerequisite for admission to grade one. The new curriculum gives students a chance to choose among three tracks, academic, technical vocational livelihood, or TVE, TVL, and sports and arts, and undergo immersion, which provides relevant exposure and actual experience in their chosen track. So I, if I will be given a chance to suggest or propose a revision for the present curriculum, what would it be? You know, the K-12 curriculum features addresses the demand of the fast-changing society and the global economy, except for the idea of spiraling a lesson in science. I am a science teacher, so I am concerned with this. If I will have the chance to revise it, I will consider and apply again of how the science lessons, lessons are arranged in high school before. The grade 7 students only have to focus on grade on general science. Biology is taught in grade 8, chemistry in grade 9, and physics in grade 10. The students with this uh, system have mastery of the science lessons. Um, and then we can assure that the students are equipped with the necessary science theories, principles, and scientific skills before they entered senior high school and the tertiary level. Well, that's it. I am Mr. Edwin Hanyalangana.